We have something totally batshit crazy for you guys today. The B67 TV Tower. This bad boy is over 2,000 feet tall and your homegirls are gonna be climbing to the tippy tippy top. When Fall was originally released in 2022, I had no idea of how well it was going to be received. When it goes out into the world, it's really anyone's guess of how things will play. So it was an amazing surprise to all of us of how impactful the film seemed to be. It was a sleeper success. Word of mouth really helped and then it grew and it grew. Stephen King tweeted that he loved Fall and he wished he'd written it. It was coming up on my Instagram reels that, without me being involved. And recently I saw an Instagram reel of a uh, a guy hanging off a building, and all the comments were saying, it's like the movie Fall. It's just really strange to see that. We felt when we were even developing it that like, there's something very inherent of fear of heights. And if we could replicate that into a genre movie, it would work. Looks a lot bigger up close, right? This is sick. This is awful. Movies have touched on a fear of heights used it maybe as a device in a sequence, but no one had ever really done a movie purely on that. And it got us kind of excited to explore that and really kind of make the ultimate heights movie. What the hell are we doing? We really wanted with Fall to make it all about the experience. And it's about what you feel on that ride and how do we take the audience through that. The audience has to feel like it's something that could happen to them. Like, would you really climb this tower? And as soon as you start adding in, you know, drug cartels and everything like this, then they're like, well, that wouldn't happen to me. There is a real putting yourself in that person's shoes and feeling like, oh my God, like this could happen. And I think if you can ground it like that, then people really go along with the ride. We're gonna die. No. No, we're gonna be okay. COVID pulled back the curtain and it showed us that we're not safe and that at any moment this could come crashing down. And I think there was a primal fear that we all felt. And I wonder if it's that fear that this movie tapped into, that we all sensed that primal fear, and now we've got this primal movie, two girls trapped in danger on the top of a tower. You just had a bad dream. You're nice and safe. 2,000 feet up in the middle of nowhere. We knew we wanted to do something high up. We didn't know exactly what the structure would be that we're on. We threw around different ideas like cranes and, you know, like mountains and all these kind of things. And then we came across the towers in the American desert that stretch all the way up, which to me was a new thing. It's something we've never seen before. And we just felt like it wasn't just a tower in the movie, it was a character in the movie. And we decided to play it like it's Godzilla. This is the monster of the movie. Tried to give it sound effects to show that. We wanted to groan and we wanted to roar like a monster would. And we wanted it to be like rusty and earthy and old and look like it would fall apart at any moment. Suspense comes from us seeing something that characters didn't and know something's coming. And I think like things like rattly, loose screws, things coming off. As an audience, oh God, stop, go that back down. <laughs> And the creaks and the groans before say something breaks is kind of setting up the fact that when we hear that again, we know something might be happening. So there's lots of these kind of intricacies that you do, but I also wanted to reveal it in a way that Becky experienced it in its kind of tangible form. It's really tempting just to kind of cut to gorgeous drone shots and overhead shots, but, but at the wrong time, you're kind of getting ahead of the character. So resisting, for the most part, to go wide before she's seen it wide. Not revealing too much too soon, and more about the feeling of her hand on the ladder and the sound that she was hearing, and just the focus of her being able to be conscious of her own breathing and be much more elemental in the kind of way that we, we portrayed it. See? It's easy. We were really compelled by the idea of making a movie focused on the fear of heights. But then the core beneath it, what the film explores, was very 
personal um, in terms of exploring grief and the loss of someone. And, and that is something that happened in my life and, and writing it in the script was a way of exploring it. Um, so I, it was from a real place of truth from me uh, and a very kind of honest look at grief and healing. You can reach Dan, just leave a message and I'll hit you back when I can. Get it on for the beep. Hey. Miss you. The movie is about Becky dealing with not just the death of her husband, but to lose the fear, to be brave enough to be herself again. If you don't confront your fears, you are always going to be afraid. What is it that Dan used to say? Don't die if you want to live, or? The theme of the movie, it's about how fear kills us, basically. That if you are afraid, then you don't really live. If you're scared of dying, don't be afraid to live. That's what Dan used to say. Let's do it. Let's climb your stupid tower. At the start, Becky is strong and adventurous and living life and very much in love with her partner. And I think showing the contrast of what loss did to her, she became fragile, vulnerable, and really went to a point of not wanting to live anymore. I think it gives her room to grow into what she needs to become. One of my favorite films out there uh, of all time is probably Terminator 2. And having the idea that you can take a character from this fragile, broken Becky to a Sarah Connor is like a very exciting journey to take someone on, you know? Oh, we joked actually, Grace and I, that it was, it was Sarah Connor from Terminator 1 at the start, and Sarah Connor from Terminator 2 at the end. The way Grace played it, it's very easy to connect to Becky. She really understood the core of the character. She had vulnerability, but incredible strength within. She was very much that person in real life. So sweet, kind, generous, but disciplined, strong, and I think that comes through. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Becky represents us as an audience, and she's understandably resistant to the kind of audacious suggestions that are made by Hunter, who's obviously the more alpha of the two. Oh my God. Shiloh Hunter is that crazy best friend that we all have, that dangerous friend that gets you in trouble. Impulsive, always fun, but probably the most likely to get you killed. Okay, now the ultimate Vex. Your turn. Becky, after devastation, retreats, runs away, and shrinks. Hunter, after devastation, kind of runs into danger, runs toward it, but it's a, a facade, really. She's hiding behind a veneer. Hashtag super badass. <laughs> okay, <laughs> in my defense, I may act like a total dick on camera, but it's worth it. I get paid for this shit. And through the movie, we kind of try and strip away that and really get at the heart of what she is. I always saw Hunter's character as being someone who needs love, but looks for it in all the wrong places. So she finds love in Becky's husband. And then she finds love in likes and in comments on social media. Uh, and hopefully she learns that um, the real love is the love between her and Becky, her best friend. Do not let this fear consume you. I am right here beside you the whole time. I think when someone dies and, and there's very deep scar that happens, um, it brings out strange things. With Hunter, she can't deny the reality of how hurt she has been from this death too and she can't lean to her best friend and tell her the truth because there's a secret there so she's kind of trapped behind the betrayal and so they're both in this difficult situation where they kind of need to go through the catharsis of honesty and and, and tear that away to, to face it i am so so sorry and now we're stuck on this stupid freaking tower in the middle of freaking nowhere and it's all my fault the very first draft of the movie was actually a guy and a girl, it was a couple, and they were both social media influencers, and they were doing it to get likes and to get their YouTube channel off the ground. And it worked, but it just felt like it was leaning too heavy on that, and we felt like we needed a bit more heart. We just thought, what's the best for the story? What's the best for the movie? So then we made them both girls and made it about friendship rather than a couple. John and I, writing two female characters, obviously as an adventure to our best, but really, uh, my wife, she was the first person we showed the script to, and 
she forced us to look through the lens of that was her and her friend. And, and she has a friend who is a bit like Hunter and my wife actually is a lot like Becky. And looking at it through the kind of reality of real people and real relationships and, um, and looking at when you have a long relationship with a friend from childhood, you know, there's a cementing there of something that arguably can go beyond a spouse, right? That, that can, it has deeper roots. And I think really kind of digging into that guided it into where it is. You look... Um, awful. Yeah, like really fucking awful. Well, come here. I think women, in my own experience at least, are more connected with their feelings <laughs> than men. Um, and, uh, and certainly on the basis of who this was based around and who I knew and based this on, um, I felt like that was a true version of how that would be. I told you, you should just be yourself. That was really great. Did I kill Danger D? Mm-hmm. I'll help you bury the body. I met and, and auditioned a number of people individually, but then really when, when it came down to it, it was more about the combination of how those characters gelled or didn't. We did chemistry reads to see who was going to be the best actors for the movie. I, like, really can't do it. I'm... I don't know, I'm, like, fucking petrified. I'm shaking right now. Okay, okay, come here. <sighs> It's okay, it's okay, Becky, just breathe. Just breathe. And I know Grace had reached out to some of the other girls that she was gonna chemistry read and they didn't want to do that. Ginny did. They called each other and rehearsed and were by far the best. The chemistry between the two of them was really what kind of got me excited. The scene came alive and the way Ginny played off Grace and she, she just has this inherent adventurous nature anyway. I hate you, you know? I know, I know, and I hate you so much more. <laughs> There's lots of her that is Hunter, especially she likes to swear a lot. That's, that's one of the things that Ginny could proudly say. Fuck you, Scott. The way that they acted offset, it was very much on set, the dynamics between them as people. Together, they kind of helped each other in not just as characters, but as actors. What I noticed over the course of filming is just how they became close friends and then that showed on camera. <laughs> We decided it should feel real, not just for us watching it, but for the actors performing it. We put them in a green screen, they're only going to slightly feel it. How's it hanging? <laughs> We're not really filming up a 2,000 foot tower, but even when we shot at the top of this 100 foot tower, you might as well be anywhere. The wind's there, the sun's there, you're out in the desert the whole time. You're on a harness, it hurts, like you're affected by it, and that comes through to the performance. So, you know, what me and Scott had talked about is like, embrace that. I have to climb out onto that rope. Pull myself up. Yeah. Then unhook my carabiner. Yeah. Pull myself back down. I hang on by one hand and then swing off that tower and try to hit the, the satellite dish. If you're putting someone in a situation with heights, it's like, be honest about how you are with heights. So when I went through the original audition process, Grace, she said, look, I, I've obviously never been up a tower like that, but I, I, I feel like I would be okay with it, but I can't guarantee it. Day before the shoot, I went there, uh, with Grace and, and Ginny. Fuck yeah. It's not bad, right? No. I want to take a picture. It's like it's less intimidating than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Actually. Essentially, it's a large piece of stunt truss with concrete blocks kind of holding it down. And obviously, a million safety checks to check this thing is safe. But psychologically, it was a great anxiety between uh, myself, Ginny, and Grace about whether it was going to be okay going up there. So we all went up the tower together for the first time and it was terrifying. Like, cause your peripheral is, you're 2000 feet up, the wind is blowing, you don't feel safe. But then Grace, she saw the view and, and, and she started crying. And she was crying not with the fear, but the relief and the joy and the, the overwhelmed kind of uh, sensory overload. And, and, and ultimately we, we captured that because we were doing this extreme filming and putting people through real raw environments. I think you have to fall back on the truth of what you are because in that situation, you're experiencing something real. You need the core of your character to be true so the truth comes out as a performance. So it was important to have essentially the essence of the character within the actor themselves. Ginny and Grace, they went all the way, and without that, the movie just wouldn't be the movie, really. Look at this. Oh my god. Hey. 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 
So we did the hard work on the concept and the characters and the emotional drive, but then it becomes a technical challenge. Scott and I wanted it to be a riddle to the movie that we've got these two characters trapped in this situation with these certain props. And we want the audience to sit there and think, what would I do in that situation? So we thought there's a rope, what could we do with a rope? Okay, we have 50 feet of rope. We can try to fish for coverage. Yeah. What, if we, um, what if we had a drone? We could have flown it back to our motel with a good old fashioned note. Now it's like a big Sudoku puzzle where we've got all of the elements and we've got to sequence these things in a way that builds tension and then gives us payoffs. Get it back, guys. Ah. Ah. <laughs> nice! <laughs> we basically spent a lot of time in my yard. We marked out on the ground the kind of shape of uh, this small disc and trapped ourselves into a problem and then tried to write our way out of it. I mean, could she be yeah. sleep? I don't know if that feels weird. Uh, it doesn't actually look that weird. And she's like sleeping against the thing. Yeah. And I think that's where you have to think outside the box and, and, and where you find interesting ideas. We wanted a sequence where Hunter has to do a dangerous climb. So we're trying to motivate, what, where's Hunter climbing to? And that's when we thought, okay, what if the drone's in the bag and Hunter's got to do a dangerous climb to get the drone to bring it back up. Wait, maybe I can get it. What do you mean? You said it was too smooth, no footholds. Scott got this idea that what if the drone runs out of batteries and they need to charge it? And I was like, how would you charge it up there? And then Scott suggested the phone charger trick, which I just didn't believe would work. So we literally sat down with Scott's phone, we unplugged a bulb, and it worked. And I couldn't believe it. Now I'm just gonna line up the prongs with the elements in the lamp, and... How's that for a dumb YouTuber? We had this running idea that we would give the audience hope and then snatch it away from them last minute. So with the drone, we came up with the idea of the truck. And then we thought we need to set up that truck. So then that immediately gives us a scene at the top of the movie. Watch out! What you don't want is the audience to be ahead of the characters, because when that happens, you're frustrated at the characters' actions rather than kind of with them. And that balance is kind of hard to get. Our biggest concern was a 90 minute feature. Are we still gonna be scared of heights after 20 minutes, after 30 minutes? Are we just gonna get used to it? Scott sent me the assembly edit and he said, I think it's all right, which I've never heard from Scott. Normally it's like, this is awful. I hit play on the assembly edit and watch the first 10, 15 minutes. And I was like, okay, it's working, it's working. And then as soon as they started climbing the tower, I felt nervous and I was like, oh, we've, we might have something here. And then an hour in, I'm still nervous. So at that moment, I realized it's gonna work. People are afraid of stuff. You know, people don't wanna climb a tower, but they wanna go in and get freaked out. And I think right now people want experiences. We made the film for a big experience. This is a roller coaster. Strap in and go. Oh, fall in a few words. Vultures. <laughs> Treacherous. <laughs> Harrowing. <laughs> Thriller. The film follows Becky and Hunter, who climb an abandoned radio tower, 2,000 feet in the air, to scatter the ashes of a loved one. And that climb and that event goes horribly wrong when the ladder breaks. And they find themselves trapped at 2,000 feet with no way down. The script was sent to me, and really I thought, could I do something like this? Would I be able to do something like this? And it kind of scared me, which only made me want to do it more. As soon as I heard about it, I was over the moon excited. And it was also right in the middle of 2020 when nobody had worked in a long time. Everybody had been stuck inside their house for a long time. So just the idea of going and filming a very fun action movie in the desert outside with other people sounded like so much fun. The film is based on a real tower. It's based on a tower um, in Arizona that was the fourth tallest structure in the US. And you can get people up them and you can kind of do that, but you can't get a crew up there with them is the problem. And then the challenge becomes, how do you shoot a film that takes place at 2,000 feet? We found this location and it had this great landscape, looked amazing, it had this drop off. It's a nice view, huh? Holy shit. 
and it had just enough room to structurally uh, build out an actual 100 foot tower on the top of a 2000 foot cliff and the girls went up it and we filmed it from that height. Scott communicated how much he wanted to shoot practically with us actually out there, actually high up. That's the kind of thing you dream of being a part of as an actor because it makes my job a lot easier to actually be burning in the sun, uh, terrified that I'm going to fall down to my death. Are you okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah. Ah. Preparing for the physical side of the film, I actually worked with two personal trainers, especially because it was post-quarantine, so I don't think any of us had exercised too much prior to doing this movie, so it was a good kick in the ass, too, to get back on that train and make sure that we were physically able to handle the stunts that were going to be involved. I was getting abs <laughs> in the shortest amount of time. We knew we were going to be filming in the desert where it's very hot, doing a lot of stunts. So he had me work out outside in sweatshirts and sweatpants and with as much clothing on as possible. So I really could get used to what it was going to be like to be so physically active in such extreme temperatures. We were going to film in these crazy conditions. Once they're up there, it's very hard for me as director to really like, access and direct them. So before we filmed the movie, we did a little bit of rehearsal with Gray Scott and I in Scott's backyard. And he actually built the size of the platform that we were gonna be on. He built a version of that that's literally like this big. It was tiny. That was the first thing I remember when I saw it. I was like, how are we gonna be a hundred feet up, two of us on this tiny, tiny, tiny platform? I can be laying back like this. And we basically blocked out the movie. You know, it was kind of a stage beyond the writing where we reformed it, changed it, and they they, they felt what was right and what they would do and how they might sleep and stand and sit and just naturally kind of feel out the bones of this thing. I could, I could be away and then look and kind of get I mean, roll like this, over, the ankle like be roll on. over as the night, because I'm kind of restless. And I was able to rehearse through the movie with them, up close with them in an intimate kind of good directing environment so that when we went to set the week later and went up to the tower, we had a frame of reference. My biggest concern was I was like, I told Scott I was not afraid of heights. I cannot let him know that I'm kind of freaking out right now. Good luck, Jenny. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I got this now. So I was just really trying to play it off like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm not scared at all when I was up there like, oh God. So what attracted you to this project? <laughs> oh, <I> this. <laughs> when you get up there and the platform is tiny, the wind kicks in and it starts to move a little bit and it feels real scary up there. Grace and I would just go home at the end of the week and be like, what did we sign up for? We're gonna die on this movie. I can't explain it. I mean, the air, the air feels different. It, it, and you're looking down, you, you feel this, whew, like this stomach drop a little bit being that high. That just really adds to the fear. It adds to like, you could fall off this thing in a heartbeat. Like there's no space up there. It's just this adrenaline rush of, holy cow, this is so immersive. This is what I was hoping it was gonna be like, and it is, and this feels like, old movie making. I mean, we are out here and up here. With the adage that you want to do everything for real, it means doing the stunts for real. Hunter! <laughs> Apart from the opening sequence, it, it's all real. Come back up! Hunter, no! Hunter! Ginny and Chris both rose the challenge and did it themselves. It was never expected for us to do our stunts. It was always offered if we wanted to try it. I think there was just so much curiosity on my part and Ginny's to try it that we, we did. Okay. We did all of our own stunts. We were actually hanging on with one hand. It was terrifying. We really needed to be in good physical shape to be able to do this movie. I had blisters on my hands from climbing that ladder. We would be climbing that tower for hours every day, up and down, up and down. You know, you do a take climbing up, you got to climb back down to do another take to climb back up. They had to wrap our hands in CGI the wraps out at certain points because our hands were just getting so torn up from climbing this thing so many times. On a 
a certain shot where Grace grabs a ladder and we've rigged a camera to a ladder and I, I really wanted that kind of going over the edge of a roller coaster feeling. Did all this stuff thinking I'm going to use a double and then Grace is like, can I just do it? Can I just like do the fall? I was like, are you sure? And I think because I was comfortable with it in small bits, when we got to the actual main ladder drop moment, I was really excited because I thought, I can do this. I've done the other things. I, I can do this. I want to do this. Capturing that, keeping it all real, is, is key. Audiences want the real deal. And for this movie, it lives or dies on capturing that reality. Are you okay? Yeah. Did you get hurt? Ow. It's kind of beautiful from up here. It did feel like the desert was the diva of the shoot. The elements were crazy. Grace and I would just be like clutching on for dear life, which helped our performances, but we were actually up there like clutching on for dear life. How's it going, producer? The thing about it is going back into like live gallery. We should have done it on green screen, shouldn't we? Should have done it on green screen. Looks so good. It's just I wish you could film some of it, right? The engineers had told us if winds get over, I think, 30 miles an hour at the top of this thing, the girls can't go up the tower, right? Because structurally, there is a risk there that the tower's going to come down, right? So after 30 miles an hour, it's off. 50 miles an hour and above, we're in trouble. Yeah, I've never seen this weather in the desert like this. We had 60 mile per hour winds at one point, so we couldn't film because the tower was shaking. Because the risk of the things coming down, we all had to rush into this little hut which was our only shelter, in case it collapsed. And we were like, oh my God, this is a disaster. I want to stop, eh? And then we had thunderstorms that came in. It just started heavily raining, warm rain, like odd conditions. Uh, so it's raining, it's the hottest day yet, and it's raining, and the rain is uh, is melting the towers. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and on top of that, we found out that the tower somehow was built on top of some sort of flying ant nest. There was a sheet around the tower of flying ants. They would land on your hair and land all over you, and it was disgusting. Uh, uh, we've had an infestation of flying ants, and um, we can't get close to the tower because there are so many. Um, oh, man. We just got hit with, like, thing after thing after thing, but I think it really did, like, lend itself to the survival aspect of this film. Like, we definitely were feeling that in real life, too. Trying to fight the elements and fight the weather and fight reality just doesn't work. And we kind of surrendered to it and just embraced it all. And when we embraced it all, it just delivered, delivered the goodness. The biggest thing was because of the weather and what we were up against, sometimes we were switching scenes around. So before we prepped the movie, Scott kind of told Grace and I, prepare like a play kind of be prepared to do any scene at any time because we don't know how the weather is going to be cooperating. So realistically, that was the biggest challenge was uh, having some moments where we had to just switch the schedule around. We'll get there. That's where Grace and I worked really well together was we would just say, okay, let's sit down. We're going to run this, the shit out of this for 20 minutes and then we're just going to go. And we were just kind of like on our feet, ready to do anything at any time. Yay. When, when I start designing the film, I say, oh, I'll have this shot and it'll develop into this and this will look like this and thinking all the things the director does. And in the end, it was like, we're just looking to get the camera rolling in the air, right? So like technically, it, it was the most challenging film I've ever been involved with, for sure. Just to be able to film was so difficult. It's pretty miraculous that we got as much as we did actually shot. It's, it's miraculous we have a movie. <laughs> The USP of this film 
is not gore and, and extreme horror. It's actually the tension, suspense, implied horror that's a bit more unique than that. And I was very aware that, yeah, the key thing to this film was not actually something that needed to be a restricted movie. When we were filming the movie, we didn't know if we were R or if we were PG-13. So I said the F word so many times. I think Scott wanted to kill me in post when we were trying to get a PG-13 rating. You're what? stealing my car! What? No, you mother <laughs> What the hell? There was quite a bit of swearing uh, that Ginny and I both did, both of us did. And we got to the end of the movie and realized, oh, we got a great movie, but no one's gonna see it because it's a restricted R. And the audience that I really wanna see it, like my kids and people of that age and the younger audience, they're just not gonna be able to get to see it. And the Distribute Alliance get was the same. They're like, okay, we love the movie, but we can't release it wide. We can't, there's a limited audience to this movie because it's restricted. It's like, right, we're gonna have to reshoot it if we're gonna, be able to change that fact. But for a movie like this, we can't reshoot it. We're not a big tentpole, we're a small movie. We don't have the resources, we don't have the time more than anything else. And really what saved this movie and brought it into a wider audience was, was technology. Rather than having to go back and do a bunch of reshoots, they're able to recreate you in AI and change your mouth that isn't gonna put us in an R rating category. And now we're stuck on this stupid freaking tower in the middle of freaking nowhere. We were able to change dialogue, change performances, essentially do a post-production reshoot of the movie and enable it to get a, a, a better certificate. What are we gonna do? Hey, we're not gonna panic. I have no clue what bits have been changed. As far as I know, uh, every movement my mouth made in that movie, my mouth made. Like without the technology, this would have been a small restricted film that had a much smaller audience, uh, potential audience. And then being able to use the technology to open it out to a wider audience, I think gives the film its best shot at, at being seen and enjoyed. This is a film that you have to see in a movie theater. This is a movie that plays so well when you are really in a dark room on a big screen experiencing this with an audience. When I go to the cinema, I want an experience. I want to feel the fear of falling. I want to get sweaty palms, right? I really want people's heart to be pounding. And I think the film grammar of this movie, it puts you into that world, that it's not just watching and witnessing, it's about point of view, it's about tapping into the person to make it a theatrical experience. It being so large and up there in front of you, I think people will get to have a little bit of a feeling of what I got to experience. <laughs> you know, seeing, seeing how high up we were and the scale is immersive. Every cinematic experience that I can remember that, that stood the test of time with me personally has been when I've really experienced something and I felt like I experienced it in the best environment ever. And I think, you know, shooting this movie for IMAX and for the big screen and doing it that way, it was really to kind of play into that and, and, and really bring like this huge theatrical experience to an audience. If you want to be scared, freaked out and challenged by your comfort level because the heights are so terrifying, you should watch this.